statistical physics and biology is an interesting subject uh, because generally sort of statistical physics deals with complex systems of many molecules. That's the essence of statistical physics. It generally studies liquids, gases, uh, solids, things with many, many molecules, and these molecules interact, giving rise to various complex phenomena. So liquids sort of can flow, sort of you can have phase transitions from different states of melting of ice, things like that. Now, biological systems are certainly built of many molecules, but the difference is that biological systems are not homogeneous. So all molecules in, in an ice cube are the same molecules, whereas if I look at the molecules inside a human body, there are lots of different molecules interacting in different ways. So the question is, how can statistical physics approach the complexity of biological systems? And historically, there were many examples where uh, ideas of statistical physics were applied in biology um, in sort of in various sort of ways and forms and at various levels. But again, there is no unified statistical theory of biology, and I doubt there'll be any. Nevertheless, I believe that statistical physics is very helpful in thinking about biological phenomena, primarily because biological phenomena are astochastic. So randomness plays a huge role. And B, there are lots of players in biological systems. These players can be many molecules in a body. This can be many cells in a, in, a, in, a, in a human body. Or this can be, for example, many organisms in a population. And again, the two underlying things is stochasticity and a large number of sort of players. So let me give you a couple of examples or a few examples where statistical physics uh, or ideas of statistical physics are applied in biology. Um, perhaps we can start at the highest level, above biology. So the field of biology that really lives above all the complexity of molecular interactions is genetics. Genetics is interested in emergence of new um, sort of, uh, say, mutations, and then how these mutations sort of spread in the population. For example, you have a population of uh, white mice, and then one of them becomes gray, and now you have the gray mice are uh, easier to hide in this, in this environment, so gray would spread in the population. So that's, that's an evolutionary process, and the field of biology that deals with this is genetics or population genetics. So it's population genetics is generally interested in this kind of sort of collective phenomena. Um, why statistical physics, what statistical physics has to do with this. So if you think deeply of what's happening with this example of sort of one gray mouse in the, in the population of white mice, uh, you say, okay, so now we have one, one gray mouse, and uh, what's going to happen in the next generation? So this gray one has some advantage, so it can hide from some predators. However, on the next generation, it may leave no offsprings, and then this gray mice is gone despite of having some advantage. Or it may give a little bit more offsprings. These offsprings are hiding from the predators better than the, than the offsprings of the white mice. So they're spreading. But then spontaneously, so the population of gray mice may shrink. And then all the gray mice are gone. Although they had some advantage, they just didn't make it. So if you think about this, so mathematically, this process is actually very similar in many respects to diffusion. I can have a drop of ink, and the drop of ink will be spreading and spreading and spreading. However, if the drop is really tiny, the drop can change shape, and it can sort of just disappear, essentially, very rapidly sort of diffuse without sort of leaving big spot. So in many respects, so the process of spreading of a new phenotype or a genotype, in spreading of new genotype in population is like a process of diffusion. It's driven by stochasticity, and there are lots of random there are lots of players. And what was shown mathematically, um, first by geneticists in 1930s, um, and then physicists rediscovered this works, is that this process in genetics is driven by the same equations that drive diffusion, molecular diffusion in physics. And this class of equations are called Fokker-Planck equations. And now, population genetics is heavily populated by physicists, and it's indeed a branch of biological physics. So we can go sort of also below sort of biological complexity at the level of molecules. 
And at this level, uh, sort of statistical physics is obviously ruling the, the kingdom of, of uh, molecules. Um, and we can look at processes like protein folding. So how protein, which is synthesized as a linear chain of amino acid, spontaneously acquires its, its structure. And obviously, sort of statistical physics uh, is applicable to the system because, again, there are lots of fluctuations. And nevertheless, sort of it falls into unique structure. So evolution is one example, sort of molecular, molecular folding is another example. At the intermediate scale, where you see all the complexity of biological uh, systems, you can look at acti sort of activity of genes. So you know that sort of our genome contains about 30,000 genes. Those genes are active or inactive, uh, depending on the environment and depending on some other genetic programs. But in different cells, that are otherwise identical, in one cell, this gene can be turned on. In the other cell, this gene can be turned off. It generally should be on, so in most of the cells it's on, but in some cells you have more of the, so this gene is more active. In other cells, this gene is less active. So again, this is driven by stochasticity of some molecules inside, inside a cell, so they're diffusing. So somewhere this gene got activated, somewhere it didn't get activated. So there is a great deal of stochasticity, nevertheless, we know that biological systems are very, very reliable. If you look at certain processes like a developmental process, you had one cell, becomes two cells, four cells, then, then it acquires sort of shapes and sort of um, and body parts. So it's a very reliable process despite of some underlying stochasticity. So statistical physics is certainly interested in this process. And it may be reminiscent of some of the features, for example, of condensation of water, where initially very disordered system, each molecule is still sort of fluctuating and jiggling independently, though it can all it will it will all end up being, say, a snowflake, a very regular, very structured, um, beautiful sort of organization. Another example might be sort of uh, that sort of comes to mind uh, nowadays when we start looking at networks of interacting molecules, is the structure of a biological network. Each node of the network might be a gene or a protein. Uh, and they interact, so I can connect two proteins by a link if I know that these two proteins actually talk to each other. Or this gene regulates activity of another gene. So if I do it for all 30,000 genes in my, in my body, I will get a very complex network of interactions. And again, it's driven by stochasticity. These proteins may or may not see each other or touch each other in a specific cell. But collectively, it has some, some sort of complex, complex behavior that gives rise to activity of the cell, its response to various stimuli, growth, and development. So again, it's a realm where statistical physics and some of the sort of ideas of statistical analysis of these networks is very important. Why statistical physics? Why am I, why am I sort of preaching the same uh, uh, field of physics? Um, essentially, what statistical physics does, it says, OK, um, as a biologist, I would be looking at one protein maybe two proteins or five proteins. Systems biology would be dealing with maybe 10 or 20 proteins. But from the point of view of statistical mechanics, I can say, well, let me just abstract myself from the details and say that all the proteins to the first approximation are more or less the same. And I will only look at how many interactions each protein has. And maybe just the number of interactions would be informative of the role of this protein in the overall network. Similar to the way we can or statistical physics indeed analyzes networks of interactions between people or networks of interactions between computers. Some computers or some people are highly connected and they certainly play a very important role in the society. So in this sense, although all people are different, so some may be more, may be more important or less important sort of for, for the function of the overall network. So, th so that's, that's, that's just another example where sort of some of the ideas and methods of statistical physics uh, sort of I applied uh, to biological uh, systems. I gave you a few examples, and so this sort of sets a few sort of layers where statistical physics is, a, is a applied in biology these days. So certainly application of statistical physics to population genetics. And this is particularly important because nowadays we're, we're getting the genomic information. So we see how mutations spread in the population, we see that certain, certain changes or polymorphisms are more frequent than others. So while this field was born in 1930s, um, as, as just as a branch of genetics, 
it was largely data poor field. So you can do some experiments on, on, on lab animals. Uh, but now you can actually make large scale measurements of frequencies of mutations in the population. And ideas of statistical physics are incredibly important for solving such problems as, for example, associating phenotype and genotype. So trying, in other words, trying to predict what would be the consequence of a particular mutation. And we are trying to do this by just sort of analyzing large volumes of information, knowing that people with this disease are more likely to have this mutation. It doesn't necessarily mean that this mutation causes a disease, but it might be associated with, with pre or predispose a body to, the, to, a particular, to a particular disease. In the age of, of genomics, it's so sort of approaches when you, when you sort of look at statistical features rather than at details might be, might be very important. So another, another field uh, is macromolecular folding. Again, I mentioned protein folding. And so DNA folding or genome folding is another area where we're trying to build complex models of how genome is folded in three dimensions. Again, using some of the uh, experimental data, uh, but again, looking at statistical models because we know that genome does not have a unique structure. The structure is different in different cells. Nevertheless, there are some commonalities between these individual structures. And sort of we're using the apparatus of statistical mechanics applied to polymers, so macromolecular folding. Um, a third one I would say is maybe networks, sort of this collective phenomena that emerge um, in complex biological systems. And collective phenomena is something very special for statistical, for, for statistical mechanics. So statistical mechanics generally deals with this uh, uh, emergence of structure from largely disordered uh, media. So how you can start with disordered things, impose some weak interactions, and that would lead to self-assembly or self-organization of certain systems. And we see this each time you look under a microscope, you see how when the cell is dividing, it folds its chromosomes, it organizes this network of microtubules that, that are pulling at chromosomes. This, uh, this amazing pro sort of self-organization that takes only a couple of hours and then the cell is dividing. And you can even obliviate it with laser and that would immediately recover this thing. So these are very, very stable structures. And again, the language of statistical physics is now being applied to understand how from individual molecules and weak interactions between them, you can build very complex and very dynamic structures.